Amen. Good to have everybody back out on a Sunday night now. Amen. Had a good time this morning. Felt like the Lord gave us some liberty to uh, preach and teach the Word of God. And I'm praying that the Lord will meet with us here tonight and uh, help us. And in Luke chapter number 24, without reading a lot of the verses at the first part of, the, of this chapter, uh, you know that it begins with the resurrection. Uh, Jesus arose there on the first day of the week. And as you read down here through Luke chapter number 24, the women, they came there to the tomb and found it was empty. And uh, the angels, they said, he's not here, he's risen. And in verse 13, it starts the narrative of these two disciples on their way to Emmaus, a village that was outside of Jerusalem. And as they were walking towards Emmaus, Jesus began to walk down the road along with them. Well, they didn't recognize him, didn't know it was him, and they began to talk about things. And uh, he opened up their uh, understanding of the scriptures about himself and about the things that had transpired with Jesus dying on the cross and, uh, and uh, the sacrifice that had been made. And they compelled him to stop in with them at the end of their journey. And he came into their house there and they began to ha have the meal. And when Jesus uh, broke their bread and he prayed in there, they realized it was him. And it says that he vanished from their sight. And then if you'll look there in this text, uh, 20, chapter 24, down at verse number 33, it says, And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. I heard one preacher say that when you preach, if uh, Jesus isn't being made known, then you're not breaking the bread right. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's good for preachers to think about. In verse 36, he said, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they uh, yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish, and of an honeycomb, and he took it, and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. Now, what I see here is that the disciples were gathered together on the first day of the week, and I'd like to call this the very first Sunday night meeting. This is the first Sunday night meeting after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to preach on here tonight. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, we ask that you would help us to preach the word of God tonight. Father, I pray that you'd hide me in the cross of Calvary. And Lord, that your spirit would have control tonight. Help me to say the things that I should. And uh, Lord, that you would transform what I've said. Uh, and Lord, take it to people's hearts and apply it, God, the way that you want I thank you, Lord, that you're an ever-present God. Uh, Father, that you are in control of these things in our lives. And Father, we can trust you and depend upon you. And Lord, that you've not forsaken us, you've not forgotten about us. Lord, you've promised to come back and get us. Lord, we pray that you would give us a good year, Lord. We have a desire in our hearts to please you and to do more in 2018 than we've accomplished in previous years. And Father, we pray that you would help us tonight to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Uh, here in Luke chapter number 24, uh, we've, we've kind of given you the story of what had happened about these disciples, and they were traveling back uh, down the road from Emmaus back to Jerusalem. And the disciples were already gathered. If you look there in Luke 24, and verse number 33, when they got back, and so they found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them. So there was other people there too. The eleven were gathered and uh, there was others gathered there already, and these disciples, they just walked in on the thing and joined up with them. Uh, there's some thoughts here about what happened in this first Sunday night meeting. The first thing I want to point out in verse number 36 has to do with his appearance. 
with Jesus' appearance. It said, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Uh, so point number one is about his appearance. Uh, some thoughts on that. It, it says it was as they spake. As they thus spake, that's when Jesus appeared. Uh, you know what the disciples have been talking about when he appeared? They have been talking about Jesus. In verse 34, they were saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told them, uh, they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. Uh, you know, and one of the reasons why we don't see more of the Lord Jesus Christ showing up in our lives and showing up in our church services, perhaps, is because we don't talk about the Lord. You know, people get together and they talk about other things. They get talking about work, or they talk about their problems, or they, they want to talk about sports, or they want to talk about politics, and they're not talking about the Bible, they're not talking about Jesus. That should be the thing that excites us, and that we want to talk about. And you know what happens when you talk about the Lord? Boy, He just starts to show up in a very real way uh, in your conversation and in your fellowship with one another. People talk about other things. They talk about the news. They talk about family. Uh, they just talk about all kinds of things that really are not going to amount to a hill of beans when all is said and done. You know what's going to matter? The Lord Jesus Christ and things about eternity. Uh, that's what's going to matter. And when we talk about the Lord and when we gather in His name, He'll show up in the midst. And that's what He did here. As they thus spake, Jesus Himself stood in the midst. So the first thing I see about His appearance, it was as they spake and they were talking about Him. Another thing is, of course, it was missed by Thomas. For the sake of time, we don't need to turn over there, but in John 20, it's a parallel passage telling this same account. Verse 24 of John 20 tells us that when Jesus appeared, Thomas, the Bible says, was not with them. He was not with them, is what it says in John 20. Now, I found something very interesting, because here in Luke 24, verse number 33, when those two disciples returned to Jerusalem, Look at it now. It says they found the eleven gathered together. <coughs> you know what the terrible truth is? Thomas was there that night. And he went home before Jesus showed up. According to John 20, he wasn't there. And according to Luke 24, he was. He was there when they got back. But by the time in John 20, it says that when Jesus appeared to these disciples that night, he had gone home. He had said, well, I'm going home, y'all. We've been here at church long enough. I've seen enough, I've heard enough, I don't know that Jesus has really risen, and he departed and went home. You know what? Jesus' appearance is missed by some people. They miss it because they don't come back to church. There's a lot of people that Sunday morning is all they need. They, not, they don't even come back for the Sunday night service. Uh, there's people that don't ever fellowship with one another. I have seen the Lord really show up sometimes in the fellowship that happened after a church service was over that was missed by some because they were out the door two minutes after it was over. They missed that. Uh, I've seen where the Lord showed up and some people missed out on it because they kind of gave up on hearing from the Lord. A revivals are that way. You know, a revival is not something you come Monday night and then you come Wednesday night and then you come Friday night. Uh, when, a, when it's a week-long meeting, you've got to be there for every night. God is trying to build and do something night after night after night and uh, you know what happens when you hit, when you'll be there for some and be there and, not, and miss other parts? You're going to miss something that God had for you. A lot of Christians, they go to church when they feel like it. They go when it's convenient. They say, we'll go if there's nothing else to do. That's, their, that's how they act about certain services. Uh, Hebrews 10 verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. He said there are some Christians, and unfortunately, this is their manner. This is how they are. It doesn't mean that they're not saved, but this is how their manner is. Now, we shouldn't be that way. That's the manner of some. He said, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As the day of the Lord's return gets closer and closer and closer, we need more time around the Lord. We need more church. We ought to be there when the doors are open. It's good to have special meetings. You'll hear about other churches having a meeting. It's good to go drop in on somebody else. Support their meeting. Encourage them in the Lord. Get something for yourself when you go. I remember driving to a church. We drove, I don't know, an hour and a half or something to go to a revival meeting. And uh, when we got there, I mean, there were the people that they were sitting more towards the back. And the second pew was open. And me and about four other guys, we had all ridden up there. We all piled into that second row. 
And if somebody kind of said something about it, we said, well, we didn't come an hour and a half to get a back row seat. I mean, we wanted to get the full thing. That was a good night. I'll tell you what, there were some people that got to singing that night. And there was somebody, he ran the aisles on it. He got all excited about that singing. And that helped the preacher out, I think, because he really got plugged in that night. You know what? We had a good time. I didn't want to go all that way to just sit in church. Amen. I mean, if you're going to go that far, you're looking to have a good time around the Lord and rejoice and be happy about what the Lord has done for us. And you know what? That is how our expectation ought to be about church. We ought to have an expectation that we're going to meet with the Lord, and He's going to meet with us, and we're going to have some excitement and some joy down in our hearts from that. Faithful church attendance, listen, it's still right. Amen. Years ago, that used to be common. You didn't even have to really talk about those things. This day and age, unfortunately, you've got to talk about church attendance. That is still right. It's still right to be there. We have a responsibility to one another. Imagine if your pastor decided he was going to come to church when he feels like it. And if he didn't feel like Sunday school, I'll be there at 11. You all figure it out at 10. I mean, we would. you say, well, he wouldn't be the pastor very long. But we put up with that behavior out of members. Uh, there's some churches. There's a church down in, I think it's down in North Carolina, and that pastor, he just went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. He was up in his 80s. But that fellow was rough that way. If you, didn't, if, you weren't, uh, if you weren't always there and always tithing, he would say it's time for some church discipline. And, uh, you know, that's the old school, the old way that people used to think about church. They didn't understand people that said they got saved and didn't want to change and want to still be the way that they always used to be. There ought to be a change. The Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And uh, so Thomas missed out on the Lord's appearance. I know somebody missed out on it. Something else, of course, there in verse 36 is that this was a sudden and instantaneous appearance. In verse 36, as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. They were standing around, they were talking, and poof, there was Jesus right in front of them. It was sudden, it was instantaneous. It reminds us that's how Jesus is going to come back for you and I. Jesus had risen from the dead, the tomb was empty, they hadn't seen him, didn't know where he was. You know, we are, we are walking by faith, we've not physically seen the Lord Jesus Christ. We have trusted in a Savior that we've not physically seen, but when He appears, He'll appear this way for you and me, sudden and instantaneously. In 1 Corinthians 15, you know it says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. He said it's going to happen in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. It says over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, uh, verse number 16 and 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And he says, listen, you'll not wear these verses out because he said comfort one another with these words. We can comfort one another with the knowledge that Jesus is going to come back, just like he said, sudden and instantaneously. He said in James 5 and verse, uh, verse 8, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. He said, listen, we, need, we can be patient and let's establish ourselves. We can have confidence that he's going to do what he said he'll do. He's going to come back for you and me. Jesus appeared sudden and instantaneously. A fourth thought about this appearance, there in verse number 36, it said that, he, that Jesus himself stood, listen, in the midst of them. I noticed that when Jesus appeared, it was in the midst of them. He did not appear at the window looking in. He did not appear at the back door knocking to get in. Uh, he did not appear in some corner of the room where there was a shadow and they maybe weren't sure what they were seeing. Instead, Jesus met right there in the midst of them. That tells me that Christ desires a close fellowship with his disciples. And in fact, he puts himself in there. You know what? He's not the one who's hard. He, he doesn't play hard to get in the relationship. Okay? If, when there's fault to be found, it's always with us. All right, you know, in, in relationships, uh, there will be one person at fault, or the other person will be at fault. Sometimes, a lot of the times, both are at fault. But in the relationship with the Lord, the fault's always on our side. 
Uh, and what he does is he desires that very close fellowship, and he puts himself in a place to have that with you and me. That's what he did with the disciples. He put himself right in the midst. Uh, you know what? His last night before he was crucified was spent with his disciples in an upper room. And we see that the first place that he went after the resurrection was in an upper room with his disciples. Jesus desires fellowship with his disciples, with the ones who call him Lord. That Sunday night, it was spent with them. He met with them. You know what? We want to meet with the Lord, but he wants to meet with us. Isn't that good? I'll tell you what, if, if the Lord didn't want to meet you with you, you could go to church all day long, every day of the year, and you'd never meet with him. There's a lot of people don't know the Lord. He's not their Lord and Savior. They'll be like they, the ones there in Matthew 7 that say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and done many, they've done all these wonderful works. And they'll say, I never knew you. He didn't ever met with them. They, in their mind, they have been very religious and they think they know God, but they don't know him. But I'll tell you what, if you know the Lord and Savior, he wants to meet with you. We need to meet him with him, but we need him to meet with us. A lot of people, they go to church, but they never meet with God. We need God to meet with us. Now, the second thing here, not only about his appearance, but also I see his greeting. In verse number 36, when Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, it said, He saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you was the greeting that Jesus gave them. Now, the first thing about this greeting, peace be unto you, is it assured them of forgiveness. Now, you remember what just happened here, right? The disciples, they'd all promised Peter being the loudest one of all. Oh, Lord, we'll never forsake you. We'll never leave you. Peter said, I'll never deny you. So said all the disciples. And then when push came to shove in that garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus was arrested and the soldiers came, what, said, what happened was is all the disciples scattered. They all forsook him. They all broke their word. They broke their promise to Jesus. Uh, it said that Peter followed afar off. And when he got there to where Jesus was at, there was a fire kindled, and he tried to get himself warmed up, and they admitted him in there. They began to question him. Now, we think that you're one of those disciples of Jesus, aren't you? Oh, no, no, you got the wrong guy. That's not me. And they asked him again. They said, sure, you, the way you talk, you sound an awful lot. You sound a lot like a Christian. He's all, no, listen, I know how to talk like the world. I'm a fisherman. He just resorted back to the old way of acting to try and blend in with the crowd. Those are the men that Jesus is appearing to here. Men who had failed, who had dropped the ball, who hadn't done what they should for the Lord. And when he appeared here, I believe it assured them of forgiveness towards them. They had shamefully forsaken him. They fled away. Peter had outright denied him. Uh, you know what? You'll feel like in your Christian life that you're a failure sometimes. If you don't, then you probably got too much pride. But a lot of times you'll feel like you have failed the Lord. You know what? There's going to be times where you've played the coward, spiritually speaking. There's times you've gotten backslidden. You know what the devil does? The devil wants to keep Christians defeated. He'd like to use that thing and make you stay there. Yeah. You know what happens when you fall down? you got to get back up again. Well, the devil, he tries to knock you down and then hold you down on the ground. And you know what happened when Jesus walked into this bunch of disciples, discouraged, thinking about what, how they'd failed, what they hadn't done right. Boy, it just assured them that he forgave them and he still loved them. Peace, he says. Peace uh, be unto you is what he said. The angels declared peace when Jesus was born. Do you remember that? When they appeared to those shepherds, they told them that there was going to be peace on earth. Uh, when the angels would appear uh, to different people in the Bible, they always had to tell them not to fear. Fear not. You say, why is that? Well, that'd be pretty scary. An angel appeared just suddenly out of the blue. They would tell them not to fear. You see, the Lord doesn't want us to fear. He wants us to have peace instead. Uh, when the 70 disciples were commissioned in Luke chapter number 10, verse 5, Jesus told them, And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace to this house. That's a good way to start I'll tell you what, when you're going door knocking or trying to invite people out to church, the message that we've got is a, is a gospel of peace. We've got a gospel we said, she, that we're, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We can tell people how to have peace with God, and Christians thankfully can have the peace of God ruling in their life. That's an exciting thing to present to people is peace. They can have peace with God. He told them to tell people peace to this house when they came to visit he assured these, uh, these believers of forgiveness. But the second thing that he did is he alleviated the fears that they had. 
Uh, there in verse 37, look at what happened. When Jesus appeared, he said, Peace be unto you. It said, But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. I'll tell you what, Jesus showed up. He said, Peace to them, and it scared them to death. Uh, I'll tell you what, now, if we saw some kind of ghost or angel or Jesus, thought we saw Jesus walk in the church building tonight, that would be kind of scary. I'm not looking to see anything like that, are you? Uh, these Pentecostals that say that they saw Jesus, they, I'll tell you what, that'd be an awful scary thing if they really knew what they was talking about. I said, I wouldn't like that dream. I think that I need to lay off whatever it was I ate before I went to bed. I don't want to be having dreams like that. That's kind of scary. Uh, you think about how Zacharias the priest felt. He was there in the temple, the Bible tells us, serving. And, and when that angel Gabriel appeared to him and going to tell him he's going to have a son, John, it scared him to death. I guess so. Uh, I don't even need an angel to scare me. I was in the car the other day. I was waiting for my mother-in-law. She was gonna. She told me to come where she works. She was going to get something. We were going to exchange it. And I pulled up, and it was still early. It's still dark. And I sent her a text saying, I'm in the parking lot. Well, I figured that she'd probably text me back and say, okay, or you can come to the back door. And she didn't do that. As I'm just sitting there thinking of that, all of a sudden, she was right by the window of my car. I'm like, whoa. It scared me. I was not expecting her to be there. You know what happens? The Lord shows up sometimes in our life when we're not expecting it, and it scares us. Have you ever had the Lord do something in your life that actually kind of scared you, what he was doing? Sometimes the Lord will kind of scare you with what he's doing. You're like, boy, I don't know about all this. You say, what in the world have we got ourselves into? You'll feel like Peter. He got out of the boat. He's walking on the water. At some point, he said, what am I doing? This is crazy. And that's about the time he began to sing. I tell you what, the Lord is going to do things in your life that sometimes might put a little fear in you, but he alleviated their fears. Look at what Jesus says to them in verse 38. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? In John 20, verse 19, it said that when those disciples were gathered there, they were all fearful. And it tells us in John 20, verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. You know what happens? Jesus tells them, Peace be unto you, two times there in the book of John. The second time is not recorded uh, per se here with his next reading there, uh, what he has to say in verse number 38. But over in the book of John, you'll see where he tells, Peace, peace be unto you. And then it says, He told them again, Peace be unto you. He said, Why did he do it two times? Because they were afraid. You know what happens when you're afraid? God will just go ahead and speak some peace to you again. Now, listen, I don't believe in putting out fleeces like Gideon did. But you know what happened? Gideon wasn't sure about what God had told him. And he said, God, I want to be sure. If that was really you, will you show me again? Will you tell me again? You know what? I don't believe it's wrong for a child of God to pray that way. I don't believe in putting out a fleece. Don't put, don't, don't put that thing out tonight and say, let there be snow on the ground except on, on that uh, coat that I put out there. And then the next night, let's flip it around and have snow on the coat and not on the ground. Don't be doing all that. We're not looking for signs and miracles. That was for the Jews. Amen. Uh, but I'll tell you what, when you feel like God has told you to do something and you feel like you're not completely sure, pray about it. Ask the Lord to show you again. You know what happens? You'll be reading the Bible and the Lord will show it to you. You'll come to church, and the preacher will preach about something, and you know what the Lord will do? He'll take that and apply it right to you about that thing that you had prayed about. That's how the Lord talks to his children. He'll give you an answer. You say, why is that? Because the Lord's trying to get through. He's trying to communicate if we would listen to him. It's a still, small voice that we're trying to listen for. He told them a second time, peace be unto you. So we've seen things here about his appearance, about his, his greeting. In verse 38, there is a reproof that Jesus gives them. In verse 38, it says, Why are you troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Has somebody ever done something, and you look at them and you say, Why? Like, why did you do that? Okay? Why? That's kind of how Jesus is. Why? That question, why, is reproving towards them about why are they <coughs> troubled, and why do they have all these thoughts down in their hearts. Uh, you know, Christ loves for us to believe in Him and to be at rest. He loves for that to be the case. And when it's not that way, then He has to confront that with us. Uh, somebody once asked a very successful teacher what it took to be a great teacher. They were very successful, and that teacher said, well, number one, it takes patience. They said, okay, what's it take number two? He said, well, number two, it takes patience. They said, oh, really? And then what does it take third? He said, number three, it takes compassion. You know what? Jesus is the greatest teacher. And that's how he teaches me and you. He is patient with us. And then he is more patient, long-suffering. And then he shows us compassion. The Bible says that he pities us. 
That word pity has to do with having compassion on someone else. And that's how the Lord treats you and me. When the Lord gives us reproof, it is gentle, it's patient. He is giving us sympathy, is what he's doing. Uh, you know what? Sympathy is what we need to give to other people. In Jude 1 and verse 22, it said, And of some have compassion, making a difference. It'll make a difference when people fail and they do wrong, when you're patient and long-suffering and show sympathy and show compassion on them. I'll tell you what, you shouldn't always have that, well, why'd you do that? You didn't do it right. You, you give them all that negative feedback all the time. As Christians, we need to be built up. We need to know that we can't, we're, we're not going to be perfect, all right? We're not going to be, and you can't stay defeated about failure. You know what the Lord says? He said we're more than conquerors. He tells us that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Uh, we should have a victory in our lives and not feel defeated all the time. Are you on the winning side tonight? Amen. I read the back of the book. I know I'm on the winning side. That makes me feel pretty good. Uh, any given day, my flesh will give me a real spiritual battle. But I know I'm still on the winning side. Yeah. And when the Lord gives them this reproof, He's still right there in their very midst when He does it. Isn't that good? It's not like He called them up on the phone to tell them how sorry they were. Why did you not believe it? He's right there in the midst. I'm glad that He draws nigh to me. I tell you, there's been some times that I had to get down on, on an altar and repent and ask God to forgive me. But you know what was so nice about that? He was right there. And I got up with a cleansed heart. He said, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'll tell you what, you're having a hard time getting through to God. Isaiah 59 says that if you can't get through, it's because your iniquities have separated you between you and your God. You get some iniquities covered by the blood and you'll be in fellowship again. That's what Jesus wants. He wants to be in fellowship. His reproof there in verse number 38. But then I see Jesus' invitation. Verse number 39. Look at what Jesus says to him, verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Jesus gives them an invitation here in these verses. In John 20 and verse 20, that parallel account, it adds that he showed unto them his hands and his side. So it didn't mention his side here, but it mentions his side over in the book of John. He said, you can handle my hands, my feet, and my side. All the places where he bore those marks uh, at Calvary. I want to say first about this invitation is that it encourages scrutiny. He encourages scrutiny. You know, Jesus invites people to seek Him, to study the Bible, to understand things, to know what you believe. You know what the world's religion is always doing? It says you'll have to believe this, and you just have to do it because we say so. There's a lot of religions that way. You say, how is it that the, that the wine and the bread magically becomes the blood of Jesus and literally becomes His flesh? It's a mystery. We can't explain that. You just have to believe that. Oh, okay, that's how it works. And how is it exactly that the blood is applied to me when I go down in the baptismal waters to have my sins washed away? Yeah. We can't really explain all of that. It's like a mystery. You just take my word for it. That's how it works. Yeah. You know, that's how religion works. Religion doesn't want a whole lot of scrutiny. Right. Religion says, just do what we say and shut up, okay? Don't ask a bunch of questions. Yeah. You just need to believe and trust me. You know what? Some parents want to parent their kids that way. They say, why do we have to do that, Dad? Why do we need to do that, Mom? Because I said so. I'll tell you what, that's only going to work for so long. As they get older and get more of an intellect and want to understand things, because I said so is not a very good reason. You know what Jesus does? He invites scrutiny. He said, you can go ahead and ask all the questions you want. You want to touch me? Go ahead and touch me. You want you got something you want to ask me? How about a fish? You got a fish here for me to eat? I'm going to show you I'm real. I'll eat a fish, okay? You know what? Jesus invites scrutiny. You can ask questions. You can learn about things. This is not a blind faith. We don't have a blind faith. He'll say, oh, you have a blind faith. No, we don't. He's given us a book. He encourages us to read and know Him. He encourages us to, to live and, and act upon the faith that we have in Him. A lot of people, they, they believe in all kinds of crazy stuff. Joseph Smith, have you read about how the Mormons got their Bible? Now, this, this is what they said. I, I can't make this stuff up. Joseph Smith said that an angel named Moroni appeared to him. And other Moroni, huh? And that he took his hat off, and in the hat there were these golden plates. This is what they believed. And he looked at the golden plates, 
and had some special glasses the angel gave him, and he was able to translate and write out the Book of Mormon. And nobody else could see the plates. Nobody else had the glasses, but he's presented you all with the book. Trust Joseph Smith. That's what he said he saw. You say, what is that? That's a blind faith if you believe that. But there's a lot of people in our country that are Mormons. It's one of the biggest religions out west. And you know what? They spread around the country, too. You'll see their, their disciples. Uh, they're out there trying to talk to people and convince them to become Mormons. The Church of Latter-day Saints. You, you know about Muhammad, about the Muslims. Their religion is much that way. You know, when you talk to somebody who actually believes in that, in that <clears throat> Islamic religion, you'll find out there's a lot of differences. Yeah. Some Muslims believe a whole lot more things than other ones do. Okay, they're not all the same. But if you actually look at some of the things that Muhammad believed and wrote down and all this, it's crazy stuff. I mean, there's just some really crazy stuff in some of these Muslim texts. Not even all Muslims believe all that stuff. I guess they're the liberal ones that live in America. They just don't take it all too literally. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that's how religion is. But Jesus, he encourages scrutiny. I'm glad that we can do like Psalms 34, 8. The Bible says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. He said you can taste and you can see that the Lord is good. He knows about these thoughts. Verse 38, these thoughts that rise in our hearts. So another thing his invitation does is it establishes him as the Savior. His invitation is showing them that I am the Savior. Uh, the nail prints and scars that he has in his body, Jesus says it's flesh and bone. Notice not flesh and blood. See, there's no blood in this body. The blood has been shed at Calvary to wash away their sins and the sins of the whole world. Uh, there was no blood, there was no blood, but it is flesh and bone. And in that flesh, those hands he's holding out, those feet that they can see, he invites them to look at that side where those scars are from those nails and from that spear. Now, it's a hard thing for me to understand how Jesus' body is just as real as this is. And it suddenly appeared in the middle of the room. He didn't come through any door. Okay, it's a supernatural body. But when you look at that thing, you could touch. You can literally touch the hand, and there's a nail print right there. That's how real this body is. And it establishes him as Savior. Those, those, those prints of the nails are still there. Those scars that he bore at Calvary, they're still there. They atone for you and me. They're a witness that he's the Savior forever, that the salvation that you and I have got is eternal and everlasting. It'll never uh, pass away. Uh, Jesus shed his blood at Calvary, washed away our sins, and Revelation 1, 5 said he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. This body is a testimony that he's done, washed away our sins. That blood, it's washed him away. He stands there as their Lord and their Savior. You know what happens when Thomas shows up the next time? He missed it this time. When he shows up the next time, Thomas says, My Lord and my God is what he confesses when Jesus appeared to him that second time that Jesus came and met with him. This establishes him as the Savior. A third thing about this invitation now is it's going to call attention to suffering. It calls attention to suffering. Number one, it shows us that suffering is necessary. Uh, 1 Peter 3.18, it said, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. It was necessary that Jesus had to suffer. It was necessary for that to happen if we were going to be saved and be washed from our sins. Philippians 1.29 tells us now, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. You know what? As a Christian, suffering is necessary. It is necessary for you and me to bear some reproach, to pick up a cross, bear our cross, and follow him. There is going to be suffering in living for God. Suffering, another thing, not only is suffering necessary, but it brings God glory. That's what suffering's about. It brings glory to God. In Job's story, what was it? What was the bottom line? It brought glory to God, what he endured, and the way that he endured it for the Lord. First Peter chapter number four, it says in verse number twelve, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Listen, it's not going to be strange when these things happen. That's not to be strange to you. He said instead, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, 
that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. He said God's glory is going to be revealed in these things. Verse 14 continues, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. This suffering is connected with the glorification of God. And so it's done for his glory. A third thing now about this suffering here is that it brings victory over temptation. It brings victory over temptation. Again, over there in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, listen at verse number 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. He said, listen, when you do some suffering in your flesh, that means your flesh is not going to sin. Uh, if you're going to get victory over temptation, it will not be easy. You know what the easy path is? The easy path is to give in to temptation. Now, the Lord's given us a great promise in the Word of God. He said that there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. There's going to be an escape plan from God for the temptation. But I've got news for you. There will be some suffering in taking that escape plan. You know what's going to be easy? It's going to be easy for you to give in to those temptations to sin, to give in to lust, to give in to covetousness, to give in to a bad attitude towards somebody else. You know what he tells us there in Ephesians chapter number 4? He tells us to be kind uh, toward one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Why is that? Because we're probably not going to be that way on our own if we don't try. We are not going to be kind. We won't be tender-hearted. We don't want to forgive other people. We say, they didn't treat me that way. I'm not going to treat them... Uh, I'm not going to treat them any better. You say, what is that? That's giving into a temptation. It'll take some suffering to get victory over temptation. Jesus is a testimony to them here in Luke 24 with this invitation to inspect him, to see that. It calls attention to suffering. Fourthly, the last thing is that it demonstrates substance. Jesus, when he invites them to look at him and handle him and touch him, he's saying, I'm real. Aren't you glad that what you've got is real? Amen. The Bible said that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know what substance is? Substance is something that's real. Do you have any substance? I've got some substance. This is a substance right here. You know what it is? It's real. It's a real thing that I can pick up and hold. Uh, you know what? God has given us something that our faith is built on. There's some substance to what we believe in. It is real. Jesus was not a ghost. It was his literal body, the very one that was crucified. The very one that Joseph of Arimathea, and uh, it says there that Nicodemus, they came and they got that body. They begged the body, they got the body, they buried the body of Jesus. It was the exact same body. It was real. There was real substance here. I thought about Joseph and Nicodemus. When they took that body down from the cross, they were handling it. The same way that these disciples are now there being invited to handle me and see is what he says. You know, he gives us an invitation to handle him and see. I'm going to show you in Joseph and Nicodemus spiritually. Now think about some things here. When they took that body down, number one, they got some blood on them. Jesus' is broken and, and bleeding body up there at Calvary. When they brought that body down, they got some blood on them. Have you had the blood applied to you? Have you handled him and seen to get his blood applied to your soul? Those men, they got the blood on Not only that, but listen, they got their names recorded in the book. Isn't that right? We read about Joseph of Arimathea. We never read about him before until we find out that he got a hold of the body of Jesus. That's how you get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, is getting in touch with some real substance, with a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you accepted his invitation? I trust that you have here tonight. But I'm encouraged by what I read in Luke 24 about disciples, not so different from you and me. God puts normal people in the Bible, and he's been, he knows that we're normal people and that we need help. He invites us to, to check him out and see these things. Let's all stand here tonight. We've seen Jesus' appearance. There's